Great. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Margaret Holm. I'm a member of First Things First Okanagan. Uh, welcome to Deep Dive. It's our monthly online webinar where we present different perspectives on climate solutions for our communities. We're in Penticton on the traditional and unceded territory of the Okanagan Seal people. We're very grateful to live on this beautiful land. You know, Okanagan Lake, it's about 200 miles long. It links all of our communities and really it's the backbone and the backdrop of our lives. So I, that's why I want to mention this very inspiring music documentary called The Lake. It takes place on Okanagan Lake and it involves the friendship between two singers and teachers, Delphine Derrickson of West Bank First Nation and Heather Posey of Vancouver. So Heather wanted to, um, she wanted to revive a long lost opera um, that she knew was uh, talked about Okanagan First Nations life and spiritual beliefs, but it was from a settler perspective. She wanted to turn around and, and uh, have uh, First Nations people involved in a film collaboration. So this is a new free online film it's a two hour documentary where you see this Canadian opera, but you also hear from the First Nations perspective about uh, their feelings for the opera itself, but also also this land. Uh, it's, the film is about two hours long. And if you're like me, uh, you may not want us to watch the whole two hours, but certainly it's worth skipping through to, uh, to listen to the perspectives of, of West Bank First Nations people and also the uh, producers and singers in the opera itself. And it is a perspective on the lake, Okanagan Lake, um, but also um, also the land and what it means to seal First Nations. So Lori's gonna have a link in the chat and we'll also be sending you some notes uh, about the discussion tonight and we'll include that link in it. So now I'm going to pass things over to Sue Kirschman, another member of First Things First. So Sue, Lori, and I were on the board of directors. She's going to introduce tonight's topic and the speaker. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Margaret. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Buildings are responsible for about 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions in our area. So it's important to take steps to minimize the emissions, especially with the province pushing to get more new housing built. And also as the climate becomes more unpredictable, we need to protect people by making sure that homes can provide adequate heating and cooling. And with affordability being a major issue, it is important that home energy systems are as efficient and as effective as possible. The BC government is working on these issues. And as you may have heard, is bringing in new energy and environmental regulations. So how will these new regulations affect buildings and what changes can we expect in the next 10 years? Our guest speaker, Jason Heinrich, will discuss these issues and how buildings and construction can adapt to provide a sustainable future for our communities. We're excited to have Jason here tonight. He is the building performance lead at HDR, where he embeds sustainability and energy modeling into building design. A registered architect and professional engineer mechanical. He has over 16 years of project experience, including institutional, commercial, industrial, healthcare, and residential buildings, as well as community and campus decarbonization and net zero energy planning. Jason is also an adjunct professor at UBC's School of Architecture and Landscape where he teaches sustainable design and architectural technology. Before Jason begins, just a reminder that we'll be having a moderated Q&A after his presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. And also, if you could make sure that you're muted when he's talking, that would be great. Thanks. Um, so with that, J Jason, I'll turn it over to you and please go ahead. Great. The other thing is, is, you know, if there's a burning question, uh, I think we in Zoom we can, is there the hand raise function? Do we have that? Oh, yes, we do. In the reaction. Okay, because 
Right. Cause you could, yeah, you could always also do something like that because you know, I don't mind being interrupted. I always like it when it's, when there's more engagement. Um, but yeah, let me, let me share my screen. Uh, There we go. Can everyone see the beginning slide here? Yes. Great. OK, well, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Jason. I uh, grew up in uh, uh, Penticton originally, uh, spent actually most of my childhood in Armstrong um, before moving to uh, Victoria, where I lived for a number of years um, before heading to Vancouver. But I've also been fortunate to work uh, in northern India and in East Africa. Um, with some different organizations uh, working on uh, renewable energy systems in those communities as well. So I now work at HDR. HDR is a, uh, a global engineering and architecture company. Uh, I was drawn to them because I, I tend to be drawn to larger uh, integrated firms that can work at a variety of scales and on projects that range from engineering and infrastructure uh, all the way through to, to housing. So this is just a sample of some of our projects. Uh, these are all Canadian based. Uh, these top ones in here are in BC. Uh, but we also have projects then that are um, done in the US looking for some. Uh, this one in the corner is a section um, from the Jim Pattison Center for Excellence at uh, Okanagan College, which at the time was touted as one of the most sustainable buildings uh, in Canada, if not North America. Uh, and that's now, I think, 12 years old. So that's before I joined HDR. HDR. Um, but HDR also, uh, we do have a studio in Penticton that was formerly CEI. Uh, Nick Bavanda actually had, had started that office. Um, some of you in the community might actually know him. I know my brother who uh, teaches at Penn High uh, is, knows, knows his family. And so he was instrumental in really spearheading uh, a really progressive uh, studio and they've consistently done amazing work in, in the Okanagan. So I can't personally take credit for the work they've done, but it's uh, everything from wineries to homes uh, to uh, affordable housing uh, and to the Penticton Lakeside Resort as well, which was one of the early mass timber buildings in the province. So today I wanted to touch on uh, a few different topics. Uh, first, I just wanted to pose this idea of what is sustainability, especially sustainability in the built environment. Um, I've found that over the years, the definition has changed. Um, and so maybe afterwards, uh, it, it might be a fun exercise for us as well to uh, actually maybe even right now in the chat, uh, feel free to type in kind of what, what do you view sustainability when you think of buildings? Um, what, what does it make you think of? Um, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the BC regulations that have guided uh, some of the, the new codes. And then we'll look at the future. What can we expect? And also, what can we do? What kind of impact can we have? Yes, it's good. Great. Okay. Of sustainability. Uh, typically in the built environment, we have a number of different certifications that all deal with a different aspect of, of sustainability. The most common one here would be uh, LEED, right? So it's very common. It takes a, a fairly holistic view of sustainability, trying to think about human wellness as well as uh, some amount of biodiversity, uh, energy use. Traditionally, LEED has actually measured uh, uh, energy efficiency in terms of savings, monetary savings for clients and hasn't considered emissions. Um, but we have a new zero carbon standard. This is gaining a lot of uh, traction. It's also from the same organization, the Canadian uh, or the, the, the Green Building Council, both the US Green Building Council and the Canadian Green Building Council. And so this zero carbon standard thinks about the embodied carbon or the carbon from construction, as well as the ongoing uh, emissions from operation. Um, but then there's there's other ones as well. The passive house is a, a standard around basically the it's the the most stringent uh, standard for energy efficiency uh, of homes predominantly. So the energy step code, um, which many of you will have heard of, 
right, is a BC initiative, which the step five for homes or step four for, for larger part three buildings, they uh, are basically at a, or near passive house levels. Some other ones are well, which focuses more on workspaces and creating healthy interior environments. Uh, seed, which is less common here, uh, but tries to look more at social, economic, and environmental, uh, sort of a triple bottom line approach. And then the International Living Future Institute, which they have the Living Building Challenge, which is probably actually the most advanced and holistic building standard. Uh, and so they that's that's based on the premise of, of the built environment actually being regenerative and improving our social and environmental systems. So just a quick uh, uh, brief on sort of where where I got started thinking about this. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, I guess about 16 years ago, I started working as a mechanical engineer and was working in Victoria. This is the West Hills development here. And so for this development, the, the focus at the time was on net zero energy. Everyone was thinking about let's reduce our energy consumption. And so we looked at a number of different uh, sources for thermal energy for the community. We looked at uh, biomass, so local biomass and burning that to generate heat. We looked at extracting heat and rejecting heat to Langford Lake here, uh, which wasn't done for uh, environmental concerns. We looked at recovering heat from the rec, the rec center here, which had ice rinks. And we looked at doing a geo exchange system underneath of this soccer field. And in the end, we were able to fit 200 boreholes under the soccer field, as well as recover heat from the ice rink when it's doing its, its ice making. And all that heat is used uh, to heat all, all of these homes. Uh, and then in the summer, when they have extra heat, that heat is then dumped into the ground to warm it back up. So, but uh, I'm, I'm glad someone brought up the idea of, of emissions um, because we're no longer thinking about uh, just energy usage and moving to net zero energy, right? Really, we're, we're in a race to reduce our emissions. That's, that's the big emphasis. Uh, and it's to try and curb uh, global warming below two degrees with you know efforts to try and keep it below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And... You know, this mandate is definitely, you know, as urgent as ever, considering last year was our warmest on record with an average temperature of 1.5 degrees uh, above our global mean temperature. So if we look at the built environment, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I've seen numbers ranging from 30 up to 48 uh, percent. I think, Sue, you had mentioned 35 percent in your intro. Um, here, Architecture 2030 estimates that around 42% of global emissions come from both building construction and building operation. So it's definitely the, the largest source of emissions. And if we look at our, you know, at, at the earth as, as one large system, right, that we're all part of, um, there is a, uh, essentially a carbon budget, right, where we have sinks, we have the land and oceans that are able to absorb CO2, and then we emit CO2. And currently, right, we have a, a surplus of 18.7, uh, I'm actually not sure what the billion tons of CO2 there, that's the metric, billions of tons of CO2 that we need to cut. You know, cut to achieve essentially a, a sustainable future. So when we look at a building, Traditionally, uh, the step code and the new zero carbon step code, although it says carbon in the title, it's really only looking at the operational carbon, right? So in a building life cycle, we have the embodied carbon. So the production or the extraction of materials and, and manufacturing to produce the materials that we use, the ongoing construction, then the building operation that hopefully goes 60 years or more before it reaches end of life where there's emissions associated with the deconstruction or demolition uh, and the, the waste streams of those materials. But ideally we can move to uh, circular systems where we can reuse those materials directly into the next uh, building project. So typically now buildings, uh, just to give you an, uh, an idea, um, as we have cut, as we continue to cut operational uh, energy 
and switch to say in BC electricity, which is a, a, a relatively clean source of energy, the embodied carbon and operational uh, carbon. So the emissions associated with both of these over 60 years tend to be pretty similar. Uh, so it used to be that our operational emissions were much, much higher than the embodied. So no one cared about embodied, but now as we've lowered this, the two of these are both really important. And given the urgency to reduce emissions, you know, as quickly as possible, uh, and that the, the global, I think our global building stock is expected to double in the next 20 years. There's really a lot of emphasis that we need to cut the embodied carbon of the construction because we definitely have a housing, uh, crisis. We need to continue to build. So we need to build in, in a responsible way. So, uh, so the, right now, right, the, the province especially is really, really focused on emissions and, and for good reason. But when we approach sustainability, we do like to think about it as holistic as possible. So carbon is just one piece, right? So we tend to narrow our view. So that's not expanding. There we go. So we tend to narrow our view and just look at carbon, but we shouldn't forget that we need to think about air quality, water, the nutrient cycles in our ecosystems, in the soils, biodiversity, as well as some of our social sustainability. So our community health and the health of people that are in and around our buildings. So for, uh, for carbon, the, the goal here is to look at operational carbon and embodied carbon and get both of those drive both of those to as low as possible. So when I say operational, uh, just a good reminder of, of what sorts of things use up energy that relate that, you know, that cause emissions in a building. So the biggest one in the Canadian climate is typically heating, but we're increasingly seeing higher and higher cooling loads. There is energy used for ventilation. So ventil both to move ventilation air, but also to have to heat or cool the fresh air that our buildings need as well as just the equipment and lights. So the different plug loads. When we build uh, and we have embodied carbon associated with the construction, we have different materials. Typically the, the, the most significant source of embodied carbon comes from concrete. Concrete is, is very energy intensive to create. And then also the curing of concrete also releases CO2. Uh, so I think, not that I'm anti-concrete, I think concrete is, uh, you know, there's a lot of, it, it's about using the right material for the right job. Steel is also can be high intensive, um, but there's a lot of uh, research going on to try and reduce both concrete and steel. Uh, steel, for instance, we can use more recycled steel. And there's some new, especially in the Pacific Northwest, uh, electric arc furnaces that, that use recycled steel and are uh, forming it with electricity rather than say coal fired plants in other parts of the, of the continent. So let's look specifically at BC. So BC, we have our roadmap to 2030, clean BC. So it has some guidelines for new construction. And so the, the biggest uh, initiatives coming out of clean BC were the energy step code and the zero carbon step code, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So these were meant to provide steps so that municipalities and the industry could slowly introduce higher, higher steps um, with the upper steps essentially being at a, a net zero ready in terms of energy or net zero ready in terms of carbon. And we say net zero ready because the, the buildings aren't actually using zero energy or zero carbon, but they're getting low enough that in an energy case, you could use solar PV to become net zero energy or for carbon, you're reducing it uh, as much as is reasonable and then could look at purchasing offsets, uh, hopefully for local offsets that could then bring your total carbon to zero. There's also a building innovation fund and other funding to help promote uh, both pilot projects or uh, projects that are that are looking to use more energy efficient technology. Uh, and the other thing that we'll talk about in the future, uh, 
or in, in this presentation is future shifted weather files. So we have now weather files that don't just show us our historical weather, but allow us to design uh, buildings and, and model buildings to estimate the energy consumption in future in a future climate. Uh, our government buildings have actually even more uh, stringent policies. So we have a BC Wood First Act, where all of our provincially funded buildings are supposed to use mass timber uh, and have to demonstrate why they shouldn't use mass timber if they decide not to. Um, they also have a zero carbon requirement for all public sector buildings by 2027 and some performance standards, which were supposed to arrive in 2023, but we're still waiting for them. So let's talk quickly about the zero carbon step code. So we have, uh, some of you might be familiar with, with the building, uh, uh, the building code in British Columbia, but there are part three buildings and part nine buildings. It's confusing that they're three and nine, uh, and it doesn't really make logical sense, but it just happened that that's when they assembled all the different sections of the code, that's where they fell into. So part three buildings tend to be the larger buildings. These are buildings where you need to have an architect. Part nine tend to be single family homes or smaller buildings uh, where an architect may be involved, but also uh, um, any, anyone could build it without an architect. So for both of these, the zero carbon step code, there are opt-in standards um, that set limits for the emissions per square meter or square foot of a building. So let's just take a look. So it measures it in greenhouse gas intensity or GHGI. So it looks at how much carbon is emitted, the CO2 per square meter. Uh, and just to highlight what, what, what this is really in, encouraging in BC is shifting away from fossil fuels. So, you know, we, we, they, they'll give limits for emissions, um, but the easiest way to curb our emissions is to switch to electricity. So electricity has uh, 0 0.011 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour, so per unit of energy. So natural gas, on the other hand, has, oh, that number did not get updated. My mistake, it is not 0 0.011, it's closer to 0 0.16. So those circles are uh, are the, the correct proportion uh, of emissions between the two sources of energy. So if we look at a, at a typical, say, let's look at a house, where, where is the, the amount of energy and emissions coming from? So currently, some people may have fireplaces, say gas fireplaces, you might have gas cooking. So that typically uses even more uh, gas and creates more emissions than fireplaces. We have a gas fired uh, hot water tank. So we have hot water. I have peak hot water identified because sometimes we will use different uh, technology to heat up water to a certain level and then to get it to the uh, 140 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, then we sometimes use a different technology. Um, but usually our biggest load is space heating. So when we talk about a zero carbon building, what that ideally means is getting to net zero ready. So that means shifting all of those to electricity, in which case our only emissions are coming offsite from, uh, uh, from the electrical uh, production. So there's a few different steps. So typically what it means here, so if, if we're at, you know, step, step one is just to measure. So if we're at step two, we have here uh, MERB, which is a, a multi-unit residential building, office or retail. So currently these are the, the types of buildings that are affected. So we have a, a target level of GHGI, which these numbers, right? We don't, we don't really have any context for them, but what it means is we need to, to decarbonize or electrify one major system. So switching from a gas furnace to a heat pump or even to electric heating. Uh, but in this case, electric, uh, sort of gas, hot water would be fine. As we move to the next step, so step, now we're looking at say step three, we now need to look at decarbonizing or electrifying space heating and domestic hot water. In this case, you could have some natural gas on site such as uh, a fireplace or your barbecue, 
uh, cooking or even uh, for you could do uh, electric hot water heating with say your heat pump up to a certain temperature and that last little bit you could use with a uh, uh, natural gas uh, boiler. But to get to, net, uh, to step four or zero carbon ready, this is essentially you're fully electrified and you have no on-site uh, combustion. So those are the, those are the steps. Um, and, and really uh, what we find is, you know, once you start to, once you start to decarbonize, say your, your space heating and hot water, you know, it's, at that point, you know, it doesn't even like once you're at low, it doesn't really make sense to even have natural natural gas. It's it's almost easier just to not have to pay uh, for a gas line and gas connection to the building, uh, and then just go fully electric. Okay, so but the future of sustainability. So where is it going? Because it seems like every few years we're having new regulations, and we can expect that we're going to have more regulations. Because you know the the whole goal of these is to slowly move the industry uh, towards a more sustainable future, and so the first step is using uh, future weather files. This is modeling and showing the well the the different models uh, uh, for future climate. So in Penticton, this is showing the hottest day that's predicted, and so what we can see is uh, you know by twenty let's look at twenty seventy here. Um, the models for hottest day vary from 36 all the way up to potentially 46 degrees, uh, with eventually some models predicting that the hottest days, you know, this would not be an average hottest day, but some years, if we have a hot spell, could be up as high as 50 degrees Celsius. So new discussions uh, in our industry, especially for multi-unit residential, you know, we, inc we have to include cooling, and we also need to think about uh, how hot it could get and plan for that because at this point, right, the, the cooling is not just a nice to have, it's a, it can be a life safety issue, especially for a lot of vulnerable populations. Okay, let's just, moving forward, the other piece that is, we're starting to see more is this idea of circular economy. Uh, so this is something that the city of Richmond has really picked up uh, and their idea is to try and promote both the, the reuse and salvage of materials, but also the, the use initially of recycled materials as well as locally produced materials. Uh, so there's, they're still figuring out how, how to uh, both incentivize or enforce these types of policies, but it's a type of thinking that we're seeing uh, as, it's as well being used uh, often in the United Kingdom. Um, and, and it is just helpful, right? It's less reliant on uh, foreign economies, on transportation, on trade embargoes, things like that. Uh, and then ideally promotes uh, a, a sus more sustainable way of building. So with that comes de deconstruction instead of demolition. And this is something that we've started to see in Vancouver uh, for homes that are older, initially the 1920s. Um, now it's up to, I think the 1950s. Homes are required to be deconstructed, and deconstructed instead of demolished in which all the the wood that was used so a lot of this is is actually old growth uh douglas fir uh is salvaged and then can be reused so here on the the left the entire building is is uh being deconstructed and salvaged on the right an example of a of a heritage home that's actually having the just the cladding the siding is being replaced but even the siding is being uh is being collected for reuse Water uh, is increasingly becoming uh, a concern, right? Our, our droughts during the summer are, are getting worse, particularly with heat domes. Uh, and so this, this is a project is an example actually from Atlanta, where uh, we were hired to design a stormwater uh, collection and piping system. So it's just going to be your standard infrastructure. Uh, but instead, the team uh, realized that collecting the rainwater uh, naturally could both then create a park, but also uh, also was more effective uh, as uh, as mitigating floods as well, which this this area is, is prone to. So it's not just about 
reducing our water consumption, but it's about how do we deal with, uh, with water, with, with excess water, like floods. And often, you know, one of the best ways is to use, is to use our natural systems, right. To find, find ways of working with our environments so that we can provide both public space and infrastructure, uh, and biodiversity altogether. The other big emphasis, and you might remember from that pie chart I showed, uh, is transportation has a huge impact on our global emissions. So there's continued investment to move to alternative transportation. So still allowing for cars, but trying to include opportunities for transit, bikes, uh, e-bikes, e-scooters, as well as walking and creating, uh, creating downtowns uh, and, and communities that are more walkable, right? That are, that don't require a car to get everywhere, which I know growing up in, in the Okanagan, that was something, you know, we drove everywhere. So definitely uh, an emphasis. And this is a snapshot of a, of a potential master plan community in the Okanagan that does have that emphasis on walkability and, and multiple modes of transportation. The last, the last one then is, is shifting away from the emphasis on carbon is just thinking about healthy materials and realizing that for both the environment and for people, uh, a lot of the materials that we use uh, in buildings or even in consumer products are actually quite harmful and that chemicals can enter our bodies in a lot of ways. And a lot of potential health effects have been attributed to different types of materials. So there's been an ongoing shift to both use uh, materials that use uh, and, or release less emissions in their production, but also don't release chemicals into the environment or into uh, uh, especially uh, children who are usually the most vulnerable to these. So lastly, just as I'm wrapping up, just wanted to look at what we can do uh, and what kind of impact we can make. So just uh, I have a chart here of different ways that we can reduce our own carbon footprint. So if we switch to a renewable heating source in a, in a, in our house, we can save almost a ton of, uh, CO2, uh, per year. Uh, alter, uh, similarly, if we improve our, uh, our cooking, so switch say from uh, natural gas cooking to magnetic induction cooking, that's using electricity. We can save a similar amount. Switching to a vegan diet is another option. Renovating your home's envelope. Uh, can be a great way to do it. Commuting via public transit can be even better. Cutting one long haul return flight. So instead of uh, vacationing in Thailand, uh, you know, if you've been vacation in the, in the South Okanagan instead, uh, yeah, you can cut even more than, than all of those other things. Or stop driving your car altogether, or even taking any sort of, uh, uh, of a diesel powered bus, you know, you now you're saving on the order of, of two tons of kilograms of CO2 equivalent per year. So these are just some of the, the impacts we can have, but I did want to uh, share with all of you, uh, part of the reason, uh, you know, I was, I was talking about embodied carbon at the beginning is because I wanted to, to show uh, one of the larger buildings. So if we take one multi-unit residential building, and we're able to cut the embodied carbon by 20%. So just the structure. So if we switch, say, from a concrete building, let's take that uh, affordable housing project that's planned for, for Penticton. If that, instead of carbon, I uh, sorry, instead of concrete is mass timber, that'll save over 20%. And that will create approximately 200 tons of CO2 emissions. So really you can see the, the impact that uh, improving our built environment has. Uh, you know, you think about the pain of maybe, you know, if you're a meat eater like me and you do switch to a vegan diet, the sacrifice you've made, but then you think, oh, well, okay, maybe instead of, or maybe in addition to that, I can also sacrifice, you know, building out of concrete. So with that, I will open it up to Q&A. There's been a lively discussion in the chat. Um, and oh, one great. of them, uh, I'll just mention a couple of things. Uh, one person is wondering about 
Yes, concrete has high emissions, but it uh, isn't a long-lasting material compared to other materials, so that, that would offset mm. emissions. What do you think about that? Yeah, so concrete concrete is a very important material as well because we also, you know, it's it's durable. It is fantastic for below grade applications. There's a lot of research looking into how it can be produced to re, uh, to reduce the amount of energy to produce the clinker, right? The, the actual the cement. Uh, and then there's also some companies. There's one called Carbon Cure that's uh, they inject sequestered carbon into the concrete. So the concrete is actually storing carbon that's been sequestered from another emitting source. Uh, so I think by no means are we going to see the end of, of concrete. Uh, but I think especially uh, in more dense cities, there's a love of concrete. Um, and in some cases, the challenge is it's so durable. It's more durable and lasts longer than the buildings, than the rest of the, like than the building's use does. And so we have a lot of cases of concrete buildings that are torn down well before. So it's, it's definitely, there's a, there's a question of, uh, in some cases we should try to do adaptive reuse of these buildings and reuse the structures. And I think we're going to see that more and more. Uh, and then in other cases, um, you know, maybe it's about using concrete with other materials. Are you seeing deconstruction as uh, actual bylaws? in Vancouver or other major centers in it's, other countries? Deconstruction is a bylaw for buildings. Uh, I think it's night houses of 1950 or older. Def it started as 1920, but the plan was uh, to, to move that, that, that number up. So I, I don't think it's unreasonable then that, you know, to expect other municipalities to start begin to adopt that. And it, it might take some time, but, uh, uh, you know, if we could extrapolate that and in, in maybe in 10, 20 years there, you know, it's just a requirement that buildings are, have to be built in a way that they can be deconstructed. Cause that's one of the big challenges right now is that they're not designed to be, to be taken apart. There was a question about 3d printed buildings or 3d printing used for building construction. Mm -hmm. is, is this technology potentially, can it be, uh, Green? Green? Uh, yeah. Uh, not, it depends on what you're printing with. Often the 3D printed buildings uh, that I've seen use uh, concrete. I think there's some that have used almost like a, not a, it's not rammed earth, but like a, like a, uh, more of like an adobe mixture. So that would be better. Um, but they don't necessarily, it's not necessarily greener. And I think we also have to think about what the context, where they're printing. Um, a lot of our cities, I think, actually need to become, uh, you know, with our housing, we don't always have available land, so we need to build denser. So we need to build multi multi story buildings, and and there it's difficult to do with three D printing. So in some applications, it might be, but it's probably not. It's definitely not a, a I think, a widespread solution, especially for our city centers. And then, uh, well, maybe you just see this question coming in, wondering if it's practical to reuse lumber. Do you have any experience? Oh, yeah. So, so some lumber, uh, yeah, it gets old and hard, and so it's it's it'll be uh, finished and used for interior applications or siding, things like that, or flooring. Um, so there's lots of other ways that we can reuse it. It won't necessarily be reused for uh, uh, for structure. Um, and then there is, I know in some jurisdictions they've, it, right now it's really difficult to reuse uh, structurally because you have to test every piece. There's some jurisdictions uh, in Europe where they've, you, you know, you take apart a house and you test one piece or two, like a few pieces. And then if those are structurally sound, you're able to reuse them. Um, so yeah, it, it depends and it would require some testing. Uh, there's an interesting question about, you know, we all assume that hydropower is very clean, yeah. uh, but they've been doing research showing that hydro reservoirs actually are, emit quite a bit of the CO2 and methane, and that perhaps yeah. we're really underestimating the, uh, the emissions associated with, with electricity. Yeah, it's so good, really good point. And I think, I think almost every energy source I've seen, I've, I've seen reports that unfortunately it seems like we may be underestimating the emissions associated with them. 
So, you know, trying to like you look at our dams and uh, both the production of the dams, but then also the the environmental destruction of flooding a valley uh, is not really well understood. It's the same thing actually with with uh, uh, wood products, right? The the impact, the emissions associated with the impact on the, our forests, both in terms of how the soils degraded due to especially clear cut logging. Um, is not really well understood. And, and there was one uh, report that was done by the University of Washington looking at forests in Washington State and Oregon. And the numbers really swung. And it, it, it just goes to show we, we actually still have a lot of work to do to try and understand the implications. And then at the same time, you, you know, I was like reading just recently that the tar sands, right? There's predictions that it's, was it six to, or 16 times higher emissions than than they think are reported so i think it's a yes, even even natural gas and the piping and all of that whether, whether we're accounting properly for emissions associated with fossil fuels very very true yeah yeah so i think we have a long way to go in terms of understanding our, our carbon accounting and our our impact so there's a question about uh, using hemp for uh um oh concrete. yeah good yeah, hempcrete what do you think of that product yeah yeah hempcrete's really exciting so at at, at the university right now there's a huge emphasis on looking at innovative materials that are low carbon and hempcrete is definitely a popular one. Uh, students at UBC recently, uh, I think they placed third in the solar decathlon. So it, the, the US government hosts this uh, competition for students to actually build uh, a building that's low, low carbon. And so they built one on the UBC campus. Uh, one of the profs actually works in it now, it's called Third Space. And they used hempcrete as an insulation product. So they did a, a wood frame building. And then and then instead of uh, a typical, say, fiberglass insulation, they use this hempcrete. So it's hemp uh, with some cement. So it, it's using some cement, but it's mostly a hemp product. I've seen some new hemp uh, products called isoblock that are a, a hempcrete that are formed into big blocks. So they're sort of like big Lego blocks. Some of them, you can actually stack them and they're structural, uh, but also insulated. Like they're insulative, um, or you can get ones that are basically just like uh, insulation blocks that you would stack outside of, say, a, a, a stick frame construction. Um, so I think I think it's a it's a material that has a lot of promise, uh, and I'm excited to see where that where that goes as the industry uh, continues to mature. Uh, that's about all the questions I've seen. Maybe uh, one last comment from I saw, you. I saw someone had their hand up. No, go ahead. Mark, do you still have your hand up? No, I just wanted to say, Jason, a uh, big fan of your work, of course. I think it's been a while since we've met, but uh, good to see you digitally. Um, and I, for all the people in Penticton, I happen to be in Penticton today at the exciting Lakeshore Hotel for a talk. Oh, nice. Um, but uh, yeah, just want I was going to gonna make a comment on the reuse of materials and stuff the, for like lumber and, and reclaiming stuff. Victoria passed a bylaw just recently um, that requires some buildings. Basically, if you're building a mansion of some kind, you've got to reuse the old lumber. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you're building affordable housing, they'll give you a pass. Uh, but um, uh, one of the, the so our, our team uh, did a bunch of this uh, when we were, we were building and the trick was being able to use it structurally. For that, you need to have a lumber grader. Um, these people normally work at the mill and they decide whether the two by four is one grade or two grade and then you know the, the bad stuff gets over to the chipper. But um, uh, as it turns out, it's not that hard for a, a carpenter to get a lumber grader ticket and can grade lumber as it comes out of the house. And that was a real missing piece in the circular economy so that we, we actually, I would never do it again, but we actually hand built our trusses for a project, um, uh, our couch and bay project, which, which maybe some people might have, might have seen. It was Living Building Challenge. And uh, um, kind of don't, don't hand build your trusses. It's, it's silly, but... Um, but uh, uh, but that allowed us to do is because we had it graded on site and it sort of completed that circle and, and made that possible. And it's, it's interesting how there's these sort of simple, relatively small steps that perhaps nobody just ever really thought of and of saying, well, actually that's not that hard for somebody to go and get that ticket. And then you can complete that circle. And all of a sudden then you've got the opportunity to, to do something really fun. Yeah. Nice. That's true. So I think that's, that's one of the big, it's a great example though, of how our, the industry, right. We, you don't realize you need lumber graders until all of a sudden you start deconstructing buildings. So it does take, take some time to adapt. Uh, I see there's a couple other questions. Um, there's one about the percentage of 
or percentage of total heat from this waste heat supply. I think that was referring uh, to your one of your first slides about uh, that the community uh, that had. Oh, the community. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that one. So that first phase of construction, all the homes. So all the homes had heat pumps. So they would get a they would get low grade heat from the geo exchange field, and and that was sized for about I think fifty percent of the peak heating load, uh, of the of the homes, which was about which was a the the full cooling load so they could do all of their cooling with it and then about 50 50 percent of their peak heating the thing is is that 50 percent peak heating that covered about 90 percent of their annual heating right because it's only on the coldest days this is in victoria so just you know there's maybe a few weeks of the year where it gets really cold and then they would have uh, uh they had electric resistance uh peaking heating inside their furnace so it lets you it let us undersize the geo exchange system Otherwise, the geo system and the heat pumps need to be massive and you don't get the, the sort of bang for your buck because, you know, again, you're only getting those coldest days, uh, usually a few weeks of the year. Um, and then there was another question I saw about the, the lake. And uh, we didn't use Langford Lake. Uh, we, we did do uh, an, uh, lake, uh, an, we used the ocean so the uh there's a aquatics what is it the shaw aquarium in sydney so that uses heating and cooling from a, a a pipe that's coiled in the ocean so it's actually extracting and rejecting heat to the ocean um langford lake we didn't do it it's a relatively small lake and you just want to be really careful if you're changing the temperature of any lake because it's going to impact the that lake ecosystem and any organisms so uh i think even now if we did it try to even do the lake the ocean exchange for the the aquarium it'd probably be much more difficult now um, yeah which is good again right speaks to often we have good ideas like building a dam for instance but we don't always think about what what the downstream impacts especially on on the ecosystem right Uh, just to summarize, what do you think is the, I guess, the biggest barrier to um, builders and architects and developers uh, um, taking some of these principles? And then is there a new innovation that's uh, coming on stream that you're really looking forward to? Oh, yeah. You know, the biggest, the biggest challenge, and this is something that we talked about even at the very beginning and has come up, I think, is a lot of these things because because they're new and we just don't have uh, and people are unfamiliar. Prices get inflated, so often just the, you know the prices it, it yeah like the the thing of like, like even like heat pumps right that that cost the cost of heat pumps. Whereas I talk to colleagues who are in Europe and, and you know I mean we, I, we've been using heat pumps in in industry for you know twenty plus years. But somehow it's still it's it's still we still haven't had widespread adoption, and so still the costs are just inflated compared to other other places where they're where they're commonplace. Um, and then in terms of innovation, uh, yeah, we'll see. When you know, one of the companies I've been really uh, kind of excitedly watching, and I, I'm not sure it'll ever, I'm not sure if it'll take off, but uh, Intelligent City, which is is based out of out of Vancouver, they. have They've been really working on on uh, designing a prefabricated uh, multifamily housing modules. So basically, it, it'll you know for sort of twelve, let's say twelve to even uh, I think sixteen stories, or is there is there sort of target? They want to build those out of prefabricated mass timber panels, and so they're designing. But then they also have a new fabrication facility. So the idea is that we could just design and then rapidly uh, construct and build, uh, you know, high quality, affordable housing. So still challenges with that as well, but uh, I'm excited to see if, if we can continue to also collaborate between the people who design the buildings and the people who build the buildings. Um, yeah, I think we definitely need more alignment between those. Well, thank you, Jason. This is a real inspiration for, for us 
I know that uh, there's some builders and architects and other folks uh, on this um, on this talk tonight that uh, uh, appreciate your talk as well as those of us that are just working hard trying to make our community sustainable. I'm going to pass things over to Sue to do wrap things up. Thanks again, Jason, for a ter terrific talk. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thanks for everyone's yeah. participation. It's really fun to have people be engaged. I just wanted to remind you, we'll, we'll be sending out a follow-up email um, to everybody in the next day or so, and it'll have any links that were popped into the chat tonight. So you don't have to worry about saving them if you, you can just wait for that. And there will also be a recording of Jason's presentation. And we encourage you to share that with anyone you think might be interested in watching it. Um, and I just want to make a, a, a bit more about the heat pump issue and the cost of it. The Nanaimo Climate Hub has been doing research into the cost of heat pumps, and, and they have found that in many cases, the prices are higher than they should be. And so they have put together a petition that they'll be taking to the government actually on Monday to require transparent pricing so to prevent this inflation of prices. So if anyone would like to sign the petition or learn more about it, we'll also include a link um, in the follow-up email tomorrow about that as well. Um, next month, our deep dive will be on March 21st. Again, it'll be a Thursday night and the topic will be agriculture and diet. So just check our website or uh, sign up for our new monthly newsletter if you're not already on it. And you can get the registration link um, for that in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I can't think of anything else um, unless Laurie or Margaret have anything to add. I see that Roger has uh, his hand up in the air, so maybe we'll take one last question uh, and then call it an evening. Thank you very much. We could go on for hours here. It's fascinating. Jason, how is your relation with, say, the Ministry of Housing would be part of it? And how could the people on this call and our associations support these imaginative and, and true solutions to our GHD emissions? Thank you. Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, we don't have a, a strong ties uh, to the ministry, um, but what we find is really it's a lot of the a lot of those uh, like the housing projects we get involved with are through BC Housing, so we have stronger stronger connections with them. And actually, right now, BC Housing is uh, a lot a lot of their uh, planned projects are really ambitious in terms of sustainability. Uh, and, and they've been able to tap into some of the funding that's uh, come about through Clean BC. I think the problem is just, there's just not enough of it. So I think we just, we just need more, but I think it's good, right? They're, you know, they're I think also just paving the way to, to normalize things and, and you know, get these, these you know, different technologies to become more commonplace to hopefully then start to transform the industry. Uh, but in terms of what can all of us do? Uh, yeah, I think, I think, I mean, keep meeting like this. I, I actually, I, I haven't been as involved as involved in, in advocacy. So I'm not totally sure what the, the best way would be. In some action. ways I, I would pose that over to, to some of you, I think, I think you have, you all have some ideas. Well, certainly our, our organization and uh, other people on this uh, webinar too, I can see have been advocating for stronger uh, sustainable building policy, uh, promoting zero carbon step code, which is is uh, uh, not mandatory, it's optional, but 24 municipalities have adopted it. And there's many groups out there that are encouraging their local governments to um, to adopt that step code. And uh, there's a myriad of uh, small organizations in every community that's working with the municipalities and lobbying the provincial government for uh, stronger legislation. So yeah, support your local climate organization. Yeah, Marquez, oh, Marquez's hand up some. 
Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that comment. So the advocacy piece is something that I've been uh, spending a lot of my time doing, um, hanging out with various government officials in Ottawa and in in Victoria as my role of, as uh, vice president of the Home Builders Association. And um, I think you're right on the local side of things is, is my impression there that I think really this kind of group is, is a local driven thing. If you go to city council and demand, uh, you know, the demands, uh, that has a real impact. And we saw that in Oak Bay. So I think that number is actually 25 now for the zero carbon step code, because as of Monday or Tuesday, Oak Bay voted unanimously to go to the top step of the zero carbon step code. I mean, this is Oak Bay. Like This is like, they just got out of 1967 in Oak Bay. Like it's, um, you know, and so this is exciting news. And, uh, and that was local advocacy that did that. That I think is where the impact is right now. Um, you know, I met with with Ravi uh, just last week, um, for the provincial housing minister. They're really focused on affordable housing. They really, I don't think, have the capacity to look at anything else right now. That when you you know the the lineup of protesters and people with torch and pitchforks on the legislature ra- lawn right now are all about affordable housing. It's the the environment unfortunately is taking a bit of a backseat to that, and we may see some of the codes and regulations that are good for the environment slightly delayed, not not stopped, but slightly delayed as a result of um, the justifiable panic on people not having houses, um, and that's kind of unfortunate because you know it's pretty hard to care about the environment when you don't have a house, um, and uh, and so. You know that's that I think is really problematic, and so really the effort should be and can be uh, local, uh, and the federal government's the same same way, and they don't really have a lot of jurisdiction in it. But what they are doing through you know putting their money where their mouth is, like CMHC gives a lot of points if you're doing a affordable housing that has high sustainability in it. Um, so does uh, so does BC Housing, and and uh, honest, we've been, we spend a lot of time in BC Housing buildings, and they are pretty nice. They spend a lot of time on good buildings. The finishes are cheap and bomb proof, but that's, you know, they're still nice. And uh, I think a lot of people would be proud to live in a BC housing building and they're, they're genuinely good buildings um, for the most part. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Lori uh, Parkinson asked, do you think BC, to, to Mark, do you think BC housing would be willing to speed up the zero carbon step code being mandatory? No, not at all. Um, and that would be a BC government thing, specifically the building safety standards branch. Uh, and so it was officially supposed to be mandatory in 2024, so the summer of 2024, uh, as the, the, the so-called like um, moderate step, uh, you know, and which is really still nothing like that status quo for like almost the entire industry. So it's almost nothing, um, you know, due to some successful lobbying, uh, I think there, that is... The, the best we're going to see this summer is the the lowest step, which is just measure only, which we've been doing for years anyway. So again, status quo. Um, the reason I'm in Penticton today is because I'm going to tell builders tomorrow that 97% of builders in Penticton are already doing EL4, like the top step. Um, and uh, and we I'm quite willing to tell the last 3% to get their act together. Um, and uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't feel like that's too much of an ask. And so... I think that panic of, you know, something is changing and the industry is sort of losing their mind as it happens every time a code change happens, um, th- you know, that will die down once this is implemented. And, you know, strong advocacy from the community, from groups like this works, right? If city council is sitting there with two angry builders and 30 happy people, well, who are they going to side with, right? Uh, and so I think, I think that's where you folks can really make the difference. Um, and uh, it's very rare that we get to advocate for something good at city councils. It's usually we're trying to advocate to prevent something. Uh, and so uh, so I think that's kind of a nice change. And I think city councils are kind of happy to hear it. And uh, we are seeing a very big lack of credibility from the opposition on this sort of stuff, from, from certain utilities and things like that. And that makes the job of local advocacy quite a bit easier. So, which is nice. And I see another question popping up there. And if nobody's going to shut me up, I'll keep going because I do love to hear myself talk. Um, but the ductless heat pumps uh, being much cheaper in new houses, uh, I would say that depends on what you're comparing it to. Uh, because, you know, what is your baseline, right? There's a, there, it, you know, if you're comparing it to an electric baseboard, 
No, they're more expensive by a fair margin. Uh, but uh, if you're comparing that to a gas furnace, um, they're probably cheaper or the same price in, in most of our experiences. And, and um, you know, so we're, you know, we're building some, uh, you know, some decent sized buildings right now. Um, one of them is a, a 27 unit um, affordable housing complex that'll be net zero and passable certified. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, not, not installing the ducting for a, a ductless mini split. And that's why you'll see, if you ever go into a BC housing project, you will see a small ductless mini split heat pump in the living room and electric baseboards everywhere else, because that small heat pump will do 70 to 80% of the heating and the cooling of that place. You've got that nice, comfortable, warm or cool room, and then the electric baseboards can do the rest cheap and easy. And, and that model really works quite well. It works really well in small spaces like garden suites and other stuff. Um, and uh, it's very cost effective. If you're comparing to a gas furnace and air conditioning, which is um, quite common, actually about 71% here in the Okanagan, uh, uh, that, there is no such thing as air conditioners. They're all heat pumps. And uh, it's too expensive to manufacture two types of motors. So if you open up your air conditioner, there's probably a dip switch in there that you could turn on and now you have a heat pump. Uh, and maybe it needs a new thermostat and a programming or something, but that's that's it. So if you're talking about a comparison of, of AC of gas furnace, it is definitely significantly cheaper just to not install the gas side of it. Um, and so, yeah. And same thing on the hot water. Gas hot water is too expensive. Um, the only reason most builders are doing it is because there's a rebate for it. Otherwise, it's too expensive. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for those tips, Mark. And uh, if anyone wants to continue uh, questioning either Mark or Jason, you uh, you know how to get a hold of them. I think we'll cut the uh, conversation off for this evening because we promised to end at eight. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And do check out our future uh, deep dives in our newsletter. We'll have a link to that tomorrow. And uh, that's it. See you all at another deep dive. Well, thank night. you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for coming. <laughs>